Okay, welcome back from lunch. I hope everyone's had a chance to uh, get at least a stretch in and uh, hopefully some food and beverage. We are now going to head into our afternoon session. And a quick reminder that you should have received in an email earlier this morning, the uh, CLE form, as well as an evaluation form. Please do fill those out and send those back as directed. Uh, we appreciate that very much. It helps us plan our programming. Um, so uh, I'm now going to turn the program over uh, to a session we're calling Tough Talks and Diversity Resources uh, for Bar Leaders, Solo Small Firms, and Larger Firms. And our moderator for this session of the program is Evelyn Rodriguez Devine. Uh, you were introduced to her uh, this morning, so she's pulling double duty. We thank, really thank her for that. A an additional uh, personal piece that I wanted to mention about her that she asked me to share with you uh, is that she's a mother of three children and she's the first in her family to achieve a professional advanced degree. She grew up speaking only Spanish in a family of six and she's the child of Marta and Tommy Rodriguez, who were forced to leave school when they were in seventh grade to work and help support their farming families in Puerto Rico. They came to the United States from Puerto Rico, not knowing a lick of English, that's her word, but somehow they brought up six children, all of whom currently reside in the US and are college educated. I'm gonna turn the program now, it's my pleasure, to turn the program over to Evelyn Rodriguez Devine. Uh, good afternoon. Um, these three talks confront the responsibilities and challenges associated with advancing diversity, equity, and inclusion in our practices, community, and our bar association. Our goal with these talks is to give you an honest perspective by a Black female, accomplished intellectual property attorney who's a partner at a prestigious Philadelphia firm, Two white advocates, one a business owner, the other a practicing lawyer who was part of the judiciary, and a white leader of the Bar Association. They will discuss the emotional toll and challenges that we, that they all face in advancing a mission of fairness and equality. At the end, we'll present what we believe should be the talk to action, practical yet crucial tips that must be implemented in your lives, our lives, lives of others if we are to succeed. We'll have five minutes for questions after each session and use your chat to send in your, your questions or comments. So the first presenter is Mary Lou Watson. She, <clears throat> her presentation is called A Walk in My Shoes. Mary Lou Watson is an accomplished intellectual property attorney who focuses her practice on the chemical and pharmaceutical industries She's a partner at Fox Rothschild and fiercely dedicated to mentorship and promoting diversity. She's one of our own and practices here in Montgomery County and active in the diversity committee of the Bar Association. She's the recipient of many professional and community honors, including the Montgomery Bar Association uh, 2019 Honorable <laughs> Davenport Award. She was recently named a 2020 Lifetime Achievement Award winner by the Philadelphia Legal Intelligencer. Mary Lou has been a member of the Pennsylvania Early Learning Investment Commission since being appointed in 2009 by our Pennsylvania governors. She's also served on the Women of Color Research Initiative, a project undertaken by the ABA Commission of Women in the Profession. She's a frequent lecturer on the very topic she addresses today, women of color in the legal profession. Without further ado, I give you Mary Lou Watson. Thank you, Evelyn. Uh, I'd like to thank the Pennsylvania Bar Association as well as the Montgomery County Bar Association for uh, asking me to participate in this program today, which is extremely important. Um, you know, I one of the things that I want to say at the outset is that I intend to keep my comments lit. And what I mean by that is I'll use it as it's characterized by a filmmaker I know, it means living intentionally and transparently. And so um, I'd like to start out at, by 
first acknowledging um, just a few of the many people who have lost their lives as a result of racism, such as George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Aubrey, Philandro Castile, Tamir Rice, Michael Brown, Eric Garner, and Trayvon Martin, and the countless, absolutely countless names that we don't know. Like the name Herbie Taylor. I'm sure none of you know that name, but I'll tell you who Herbie Taylor was. Herbie Taylor was a black male that grew up in Philadelphia to a family who stressed the importance of education, who believed that education was the ultimate equalizer, no matter what our circumstances were in life. Herbie uh, and his, his siblings were expected to go to college by their parents. Um, his other siblings went on to college, but Herbie made a different choice. He chose to go into the, into the Navy. He traveled the world for four years and was honorably discharged after serving his country. Two months after being honorably discharged from the Navy, Herbie was taking a friend home one night in West Philadelphia and he had dropped that friend off and he was on his way back home. Unbeknownst to him, the police were on a high speed chase through black residential areas with no sirens on, chasing a young boy who had stolen a Jeep. They were going over 75 miles an hour throughout these black neighborhoods with no regard for the danger they may have been putting people in, in that neighborhood. Herbie was on his way back home. He was at a red light. And when his light turned green, he proceeded across the intersection where the young man who stole the car plowed right into him and killed him instantly on the spot. While many of you don't know Herbie, I did because he was my little brother. And as you can see, 30 years later, it still profoundly impacts me and my family. And a lot of times we don't realize what we don't know. I know that there are many of you at this conference that I do know, but you don't know someone's full story until you know their story. And so first and foremost, I'd like to ask all of you to take the time to get to know someone's story and to find out the impact that especially racism may have had in our lives. You see, racism is like a cancer. Uh, no, actually racism is a cancer. It's a form of cancer that we haven't yet found a cure for or even a treatment to induce remission. But many of us that are impacted by racism choose the most aggressive treatment prescribed by society that we believe will eliminate racism. Like my parents thought by giving us all of the opportunities that they could by busing each and every one of us more than an hour away from our home each day throughout our elementary through high school years, they thought by sending us to these magnet schools that they would give us that opportunity to be educated and to rise above and beyond the impact of racism. However, that proved not to be the case. At the end of my high school years, even though I was literally in the top 10% of my graduating class, I was told that I wasn't college material. And after my parents handled the situation and I was able to get my letter of recommendation written by my guidance counsel, counselor who made that statement to me, I went on to college, kept my head down, worked hard, had a job like many people do to pay their way through college. 
And I thought that by doing that, it would again, continue to give me those opportunities to rise above. Then I get to the point where I decide that I wanna to go to law school. And I applied to law school and was accepted into law school and attended law school. Thinking similar thoughts that I'm now on this pathway of getting beyond racism. I still had to deal with issues of racism even then. For instance, some of my classmates at a party deciding to dress up in blackface and pretend that they were the Jamaican bobsled team. I thought it was really funny to do that without any regard as to how it might impact their fellow African-American classmates. You see, racism permeates not only people, but societies and systems. And you just don't know what it's like to sit in bed wondering, why is this happening to me? And why you have to think twice before doing something as mundane, like dropping a friend home after convincing him to go to your church that night for a program or casually walking through a neighborhood trying to enjoy a bag of Skittles and an iced tea. Decisions that should not lead to life or death for someone. You see, this disease, or I should say dis-ease state makes you fatigued and the collective micro cuts and assaults that you receive throughout time lead to scars as wide and heinous as the lasting scars received by many of our ancestors who were slaves that received those lashes and lasting wounds when they were flogged. Scars that are hard to get rid of, in fact, never get rid of, and the best we can do is cover them up. So think about the analogy of racism as a form of cancer and how you would act towards or for someone that you care about that has cancer and what you would do to help. Because again, it's difficult when you don't know someone's story, but you also have to come to a point to recognize that you may not fully appreciate it. You may not fully appreciate their story, just like you may not appreciate how someone feels that is suffering from cancer or some other disease state. And so it's really critical for each and every person that is not afflicted with this disease of racism to work towards being an ally or in fact, an accomplice to fight for a treatment to eradicate this cancer called racism. It is only through our collective collaboration with one another and frankly being open and honest and vulnerable. It's hard to be vulnerable. You're opening wounds and you're not sure if someone is just gonna cut you further when you open those wounds. But it takes a lot of courage to be vulnerable and to be honest with ourselves and to have those conversations with one another. And so I hope that through this forum, we really don't just take the things that we've learned here and say, wow, that was powerful. We really need to make something happen or we need to do something. It's not enough just to talk about what needs to be done. We actually have to move into action. And I will say that for the years that I've been a member of the Montgomery County Bar Association, which has been roughly 12 years, admittedly, I was not very involved other than the diversity committee because it was something that I was always passionate about and felt that if I could do something to make a difference, that was the place I was gonna do it. And I looked around and I didn't see many faces that looked like mine, but I thought I'm not gonna give up and I'm still gonna do what I can to make a difference. 
I was pleasantly surprised when I was approached probably two or three years ago now by Nancy Walsh, who you'll hear from next, who really wanted to know what my experience was. That was honestly the first time that anybody approached me to ask me what my experience was. And I think we spent about two hours at a lunch where I frankly spoke to her and candidly spoke to her about my experience and how frustrating it has been over the years when you recognize something that was brought about at the outset that in, in all of these years, the number of diverse attorneys still has not increased beyond what it was 10, 20 years ago. Um, and so it was through that conversation that I began to feel a little less fatigued. And I thought, hmm, let's see where this goes and what can happen from here. And I'm really happy to say that there has been a very deliberate and intentional effort to increase diversity and to embrace people of color in the Bar Association in Montgomery County. Have we arrived yet? No, absolutely not. But we're getting there one step at a time. So I'd like to thank you for listening to my story and just recognize again that sometimes what you may see and get to know initially is not a collective compilation of all there is to know about an individual. So take the time to get to know others and thank you again. Thank you, Mary Lou. Um, we know, or I know from your, your history and background that you're fiercely dedicated to the mentorship and promoting diversity um, in your firm. Can you talk a little bit about that for us? Sure. Um, I have, uh, when I came to Fox Rothschild, and, and my commitment to diversity didn't just start at Fox Rothschild. It was at my prior firm. It was when I was in-house counsel. Somebody made a comment about having in-house counsel. Even when I was in-house counsel, I made a deliberate effort to, um, to really bring the importance of diversity to the forefront. You know, um, there's a, you know, many firms can see the value in having a diverse uh, clientele, um, diver diverse in size and number, um, a diversity and practice group. I mean, the more we can offer our clients, the more business that we can generate. But unfortunately, a lot of firms can't, um, still don't grapple or, or deal with the issue of having a diversity of thought and perspective also benefits our clients. So I've really worked hard to help others um, to recognize that importance. So in our, in our county, we have a lot of smaller firms. Um, you heard my story of being um, at a smaller firm um, who really you know, didn't promote diversity. How do we move those law firms in this county and other counties at promoting inclusion and, and fairness? What do we do? Well, you know, I would, I would say that the Bar Association would be a great place to start and implementing programs within the Bar Association um, that increases this collaboration back and forth. I mean, you know, certainly getting more um, attorneys of color participating in committees beyond the diversity committee and, and almost requiring that interaction because if we stay in our separate corners, there's no need for us to come somewhere in the middle to meet one another. And so I think that the Bar Association can play a critical role in doing that. Okay, um, we're gonna move on to our second talk and thank you, Mary Lou. Um, and unfortunately we're limited by the clock. Um, so the second talk um, is a good segue into um, the advocates. The, the white advocates of, um, of someone like Mary Lou Watson, who um, was approached by um, Nancy Walsh, uh, who was working at the Montgomery Bar Association and wanted to know, you know what she could do 
wanted to know Mary Lou's story, wanted to know who she was. So um, this talk involves two diverse advocates and will address um, how they navigate the challenges and the tough conversations as they push forward in their quest for equality and the critical action that must take place. Uh, the first, well, the Honorable jo Joseph Walsh and Nancy Walsh are married and have three daughters. Um, we'll call them the dynamic duo. Uh, Nancy Walsh is not a lawyer. Her professional background is that of an adjunct professor at Arcadia, where she taught for over a decade writing and expression. She received her undergraduate degree from the University of Notre Dame and her master's from Villanova. Not surprising, she's the owner and founder of a professional coaching and development business called TBD Now. Prior to launching this business, she was employed by the Bar Association right here in Montgomery County as the Director of Engagement, Leadership Community Outreach and Access to Justice Initiatives. The MBA has honored her diversity work with the Champion of Diversity Award and the Pennsylvania Legal Action Network awarded her the prestigious Plan Award for her access to justice work. She's also developed the Leadership Academy for emerging leaders in the legal profession. Um, Nancy continues to work closely with the Diversity Committee of the MBA, responsible for many of the committee's initiatives and goals, including the Summer Minority Internship Program. She is no doubt the glue that holds us together. In 2016, her husband, the Honorable Joseph Walsh, was appointed by Governor Wolf to serve as a judge on the Court of Common Pleas of Montgomery County. Upon the expiration of his commission, Judge Walsh returned to his civil litigation firm in Lansdale, Pennsylvania, Walsh and Panko. He has an active civil litigation and trial practice, arbitration, mediation, and municipal law practice. He's the go-to guy. You've got a problem, you go to Joe Walsh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he is an appointed member of the hearing committee serving the Pennsylvania Disciplinary Board and is active in the MBA. Um, he's also been on the executive committee and currently chairs the pro bono and government relations committee of the Montgomery Bar Association. I present the dynamic duel. Again, please send in your questions in your chats after their talk is complete. Thank you. Thank you, Evelyn, and thank you, Mary Lou. If someone had told me even five years ago that I would become a diversity ally or accomplice, as Mary Lou aptly says, I would have been pleased, I suppose, but mostly just confused. How could my voice be relevant in this space? Although I've always tried to do what's right, I was limited in my understanding of what that means. I'm the quintessential good girl, respecting authority, not rocking the boat, nice. Until a few years ago, I didn't give much thought to the fact that not only is being nice not enough, being just nice can be pretty detrimental to doing what is right. Many honest, awkward conversations with Mary Lou, Jimmy Chong, Lauren Hughes, Evelyn, and many other diverse friends, both in and out of the MBA, changed that for me. But the transformation began with work that occurred well before those conversations could even take place. Work I feel passionately is crucial to any efforts toward change. Work I encourage all of us to embrace. That is the work of building authentic and honest relationships with those whose backgrounds and perspectives are different from yours. Through my work with the MBA's Leadership Academy, I've had the great privilege of building deep, solid, authentic relationships with a diverse group of growing emerging leaders of the bar. Through this program, participants are provided the space to share their stories, the real ones, typically those kept from those with whom we share courtrooms and boardrooms. What happens year after year is nothing short of all inspiring for me. For when the walls come down, as we have seen here today, and people are given space to share and really hear each other's stories, 
it is nearly impossible to avoid connection, which leads to genuine relationships, which leads to empathy, which leads to action. Although this trajectory was quite intentional in the development of the academy program, I wasn't quite prepared for the effect it would have on me as I led it. I discovered that the relationships I was privileged enough to form through this directive of authenticity, relationships which called on us to be vulnerable enough to share our stories, made it impossible for me not to feel the anger, frustration, and sadness of my friends. And then simply, how do you not act on that? As these relationships took root, and I was no longer advocating for an issue, I was fighting for friends. My investment in this work became deeper, and my fear of rocking the boat became irrelevant. As I noted earlier in the chat, even the most conflict avoidant among us will make noise when someone messes with those we care about. Allowing the empathy which grew from these relationships to let me care, not only gave me the confidence to ask awkward questions and dive headfirst into difficult discussions, it also gave me the courage to make a little noise. Relying on my belief in the power of relationships, I started by directing that noise through my other relationships at the bar, including my partner in crime, the Honorable Joseph Walsh, or Judge Joey, as we like to call him in our house. So I'm going to let Joe take it from here. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Nancy. So Nancy, uh, it's kind of hard to say no to. Um, I think everybody at the Montgomery Bar Association uh, has become aware of that. Um, I know she begged me to marry her for years. I finally, you know, I had to say yes. No. Um, but I, I want to talk a little bit about, I know Evelyn, I, and I thank you for the kudos, Evelyn. Um, with respect to my practice, so I was a practicing lawyer in Montgomery County for many, many years, started the firm in 2007 with my partner, Bruce Panko, and then in 2016, I had the privilege of being nominated by Governor Wolf uh, to sit on the bench in Montgomery County. Um, and I did that for a couple of years and then came back to practice in 2018. Uh, I'll tell you, before I went on the bench, you know, um, it was easy for me to just sort of be of the mindset uh, like a typical Montgomery County business owner, um, you know, lawyer, uh, white male to say, you know, I'm not personally racist. Um, I, you know, I, I have plenty of diverse friends and, you know, I don't think like that. I wasn't raised like that. I don't think like that. And really not get more involved beyond that. You know, I would support the Bar Association initiatives because I believed in them. Uh, my firm, you know, we've supported the 1L program financially, but really never took on anyone. But then I had the chance to sit on the bench. Um, and I sat in family court for a little bit. But the year in criminal court that I had in 2017 really was transformative to me because um, I would tell people, I would sit there and look out over the courtroom and I would see, you know, these underprivileged or, or you know, disadvantaged uh, portions of our population I would see a very um, diverse uh, group of individuals uh, in my courtroom. And for me, it begged the question and it bothered me, like, why, why is that? And I know, you know, some people just maybe in the mind say, well, you know, you know, certain people, you know, you know, just end up in that situation, uh, you know, whatever their excuse may be. But the reality is there's something wrong. I mean, there's institutional issues uh, that, you know, cause these problems? You know, why are people of diverse backgrounds incarcerated more than white people? Why are they in court more? Um, and those things just plagued and bothered me. When I was, you know, I actually ran for election as a judge in the county in 2017 unsuccessfully. But, you know, one of the, the main things that I took from that was the, the relationships that I formed during the course of the campaign. Now, Nancy stressed, you know, the importance of relationships. I had the privilege of just meeting the most wonderful group of people throughout Montgomery County. Um, you know, I attended, you know, different churches, synagogues, uh, mosques, um, and to this day have maintained those relationships with those individuals. 
Um, and it really has significantly changed my life. So now I'm back in practice in 2018. Um, you know, I'm not really involved with politics. I'm not involved with public office anymore. You know, how am I going to, you know, do something about the issues that really bothered me when I was on the bench? I got involved with, you know, access to justice groups. I got involved with the pro bono committee and became the chair. Um, I, you know, agreed uh, through, you know, Nancy's suggestion to take on a 1L intern. Um, and and we, we did that um, here at the firm. Um, and one of the issues that I drew from that was we, we had an intern one year, um, you know, that wasn't, you know, it, she wasn't the best in terms of, you know, work product and, you know, there was different issues. She had worked at another firm as well. We learned later that she had some issues. Uh, but I, I felt that I, you know, I could have done better as, you know, her mentor, um, that I could have done better as, you know, the partner here in terms of communicating, you know, issues that we had uh, with that particular person. Um, you know, communication runs, you know, we'll, we'll talk about vertical communication and horizontal communication. Well, when we're talking about these, these issues of, you know, racial diversity, racial discrimination, you know, we need to have these avenues of communication open at all levels. So that's from, from the top down, from the bottom up, and, and with your peers side to side. Um, so again, I guess the, the, the thing I took away from the intern issue was that, you know, I, I needed to do a better job of communicating. I, I need to uh, you know, not have the fear of confronting someone who's not performing just because they're, you know, a female or diverse or whatever, and just, you know, try to have these honest conversations. Uh, because, you know, in some respects, it's, it's failing the student, it's failing, it's failing me as a boss. And that's why we, we need to learn to, to communicate better um, and, and understand each other a lot better. And again, as Nancy said, continue to build those relationships amongst ourselves, up, down, and in sideways. So, Thanks, Joe. Um, I'm sorry, Mary, or uh, Evelyn, just a, just a little bit more, and then we'll kick it back to you. Um, because there's another, there's another story here that I think we would be remiss if we didn't share, particularly um, in our in our roles as as allies and accomplices and and the costs um, involved in that um, that really brought some soul searching to to both Joe and myself. Um, you know our, our experiences with the summer diversity program, notwithstanding, in spite of my deep belief in the importance of this work, I'm ashamed to confess that my efforts to build diversity in the legal community stayed largely at the office. While Joe and I raised our three girls to feel as passionately about faith, service, and responsibility for others as we do, I'd be lying if I said those challenging conversations we spoke of earlier were a predominant part of our family life. The notion of social justice has always been an undercurrent of our home, but the messy parts of what that entails stayed well under. And then the murder of George Floyd and, and Breonna Taylor and so many others brought all such undercurrents right to the surface. And we once again learned we needed to do more. Emboldened by the energy that grew from the anger and pain that exploded through our country, our home, like many other white homes in America, ventured slowly into the unfamiliar and difficult discourse about racial inequity. We, as well as our daughters, felt unsettled, ashamed, confused, and sad. We knew these feelings were long overdue and we wanted to do more. Cloaked in our enthusiasm, as well as our privilege, we were excited to paint signs for the first time ever, take to the streets with our friends in peaceful protest. Yet again, our intentions were good, but our perspective and our preparedness for the cost was lacking. Joe? Yeah, I, I have to tell you, I, I, I was really, um, it really hit me to heart today, the stories that uh, Patrice told and Evelyn and, and Mary Lou and, you know, I've known these individuals for a long time, but I didn't 
I didn't realize a lot of those things about you. And I, and I applaud you for sharing your, your stories. Um, like Nancy said, you know, this was always an undercurrent in our marriage and our family, but, you know, with the recent events that happened this year, you know, we really started to talk about it more as a couple, as a family. Um, I was inspired by, you know, my daughters and the enthusiasm they had to do something, to say something. And, you know, we agreed as a family to, you know, participate in, um, I, I won't even call it a, a march, a demonstration. Um, it was sort of just a gathering of neighbors that was very low key. And we held up signs that, you know, supported Black Lives Matter. We supported, you know, I, Martin Luther King quotes, who I, you know, I love his quotes. And we, you know, we had biblical messages and we just stood out there on the main thoroughfare where we live. And I was just taken aback by, you know, people, you know, giving us the finger, people yelling out their windows at us. Um, and it's just a small group, you know, 50 some people standing out there with just, you know, signs that, you know, I, I thought were just sort of in, encouraging and, and non-confrontational. I mean, I, I had a biblical quote online from, from uh, you know, Micah. But, you know, I came back, we had some pictures, I put it on Facebook again, I had, you know, this large group of people on Facebook, some are genuine friends, some are just sort of Facebook connections. Um, and, you know, posted a picture of Nancy and, and my daughter and I with the signs and I, again, just could not, you know, be taken aback more by the toxic toxicity of Facebook and, and the comments and people attacking us and you know, I, you know, I thought you liked cops, you know, Joe, and why do you hate cops and all this other stuff? And I, and I, I couldn't believe that the reaction that we got from people, but I'm glad we did it. And I, you know, I felt like we had to do something. We had to just, you know, I, you know, we had to stand up and do something. Um, there's a famous quote from Martin Luther King, you know, about, uh, you know, for many of our white brothers is evidenced by their presence here today. Um, uh, they have come to realize their destiny is tied up with our destiny. Well, that issue of, you know, our white brothers as evidenced by their presence here today that, you know, we needed as a family to stand there and show not only that uh, we had the words, but we had the presence to be there and we stood behind um, an issue of great importance. And um, thank you, Joe, for that. We all we all realize that the work of diversity um, it's not for the weak. It really is. It, it it takes courage, and you've got to be strong. I want to take you back to some of these questions about um, people are curious about the summer intern. Um, for Joe, um, thank you for your honesty. Can you unpack why you felt you were afraid to give constructive feedback? to the black female intern? Well, you know, part of it was, it was, it was a short stand. It wasn't someone that we were really engaged to be hired. And it was, you know, I, I have to be honest with you, it, it got to the point, well, you know, it just seemed easier for me to say, well, you know, you know, they'll go on their way. And, you know, we're, it wasn't a relationship where we're gonna hire them for the long term anyway. But then I realized that, that thinking about it in, in, in reflection, um, that I probably should have been more upfront and, and had a more, um, you know, honest conversation with the person. Um, and I, I don't know, I, I probably was in some respects, you know, concerned about the fact that, you know, I'm an older white male and I'm having this conversation. I'm, I'm going to be critical of a young person and, uh, you know, of a diverse background and, you know, is that going to be taken the wrong way? Um, and, you know, I realized that that was a mistake that I think we need to really have you know, cut to the chase with some of these awkward conversations and have them and better communicate with one another for, for, for both sides to be able to evolve and, and, and have a, a beneficial relationship. And um, I, I think we talked about this before. Did it cross your mind that perhaps from, from day one, she was uncomfortable at your firm because she was the only black female attorney? Actually, the only um, one, right? Uh, correct, at, at the time, correct. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, again, in retrospect, um, you know, at the time, probably did not because again, I thought we, you know, rolled out the red carpet, we had programs set up, you know, tried to, um, you know, I, I saw in part the goal of the program um, was to sort of sell 
you know, people of a diverse background in Montgomery County, our association, the community, hey, there's opportunities out here. And, you know, we thought we set up a, um, you know, a, a nice program internally, not only in addition to what they receive um, through the formal bar association. Um, so again, it, it may have, it may have got lost in, in that from my perspective. Yeah. Okay. Let's go on to our, our next talk. And I apologize. I know that um, we have, you know, certain comments that have come in and, and, and questions, but mm -hmm. this last talk uh, comes from uh, Patrick Curtis, who is the Montgomery Bar Association uh, president. And he will be talking about leading with intention. Um, we met uh, Patrick at the beginning of the program, and um, for those who are joining us now, Patrick Curtis is a partner at the law firm of Prince and Curtis, located in Pottstown, Pennsylvania. He's the president of the Montgomery Bar Association and is a member of the Pennsylvania Bar Association, where he has served in the House of Delegates since 2015. Mr. Curtis has successfully handled legal matters from their inception through trial and civil, criminal, juvenile, family, and orphans court divisions. He attended Ursinus College and yet another Villanova School of Law grad. Is there anybody from Temple out there? Anybody? <laughs> he holds a master's in business administration from Villanova. I present the MBA president, Patrick Curtis. Thank you so much, Evelyn. Uh, so I initially had somewhat meticulously planned out what I had intended to address in this session, but as I listened to the testimonials and participated in the exercises this morning, uh, my presentation, I think, is, has evolved a bit. Uh, at this point, I clearly hope my presentation is not disjointed, but the powerful stories that were related to us by this morning's speakers gave us an awful lot to think about, and I think it's at least attempt to relate to some of the concepts that were raised during those sessions. First, I, I want to acknowledge the prominent role that our own personal experience will necessarily play in your understanding and appreciation of these issues. And with that, the need to continue to try to expand upon your own personal understanding. My experience is incredibly similar to that of Jay Silverblatt's that he shared with us this morning. I grew up in a small rural town, initially maybe two black families in our entire school district. Uh, but unlike Jay, one of those families was actually very close with my family and my mom encouraged that relationship. My family was invited over to our house to swim and I was invited there with my other white friends to watch WrestleMania three. For you fans of the WWF, that's when Hulk Hogan body slammed Andre the Giant. Uh, and, you know, the, the Dunn family was just another regular family to me. And in that regard, I was somewhat blind to the mistreatment that people of color regularly face. A very first jury trial, Montgomery County. Again, similar to Jay, but a vastly different outcome. I actually represented two minorities, a Hispanic male and a black female who had been charged with felony theft. I, was, I actually represented both of them, even though the district attorney tried me to get me disqualified from representing both. Uh, but I was able to, to continue representing the both of them. Similar to Jay's experience, the only two people in the courtroom were my clients, white judge, white district attorney, white accusers, all white jury, but somehow, seemingly against all odds and despite all that, we prevailed at trial. And so, you know, with these experiences, I perhaps minimized or ignored some of these issues that we're discussing here today. And it really wasn't until I became an attorney and rose through the Bar Association that I began to realize that my experiences did not match up with the overwhelming majority of people of color. And it wasn't until I was exposed to these things outside my own bubble and got greater experience and perspective that I began to realize how different my experience was from others and how much work remained to be done. I say that to reinforce the concept that everyone is unique and everyone has a different journey. And as stated by Mary Lou, you don't know what you don't know. 
Uh, and I fully agree that, you know, giving your best effort to trying to understand the personal journey that has been experienced by others is incredibly important to fully comprehending these issues. Second, I want to both acknowledge and commend my bar association, the Montgomery Bar Association, for being here in full force today. Four of our five officers are here. Several of those on our board of directors are here. Our young lawyers are here in significant number. Our diversity committee leadership and our women in the law committee leadership are here. We even have seven or several of our past presidents here, which is truly a testament to their dedication to these issues, that they remain involved long after their role as officers of the association has elapsed. We have not one, but two of our most recent scholarship winners from our 1L Diversity Summer Program here today. I see you, Tracy Baker. Uh, I don't know if Fahina made it, Chowdhury made it back for the second session, but the MBA sincerely cherishes your conscious decision to continue walking with us and to continue providing your perspective and experience to our Bar Association. We've heard from Patrice Wren, Evelyn Devine, Mary Lou Watson, Nancy and Joe Walsh, and we will hear from Jimmy Chong and Lauren Hughes later today. They're all affiliated with the Montgomery Bar Association. I bring this up not to brag, although it sincerely does make me incredibly proud, but to juxtapose how fortunate I am to have such tremendous guidance, knowledge, support, and inspiration with what is the general experience of those when they take on a leadership position. When you become a leader, whether it be at your bar association or some other organization, the chances of you having such great support is virtually zero. And in fact, I, I think it's worse than that. There's really more obstacles and hindrances than there is support. Uh, some of those obstacles are there's structures in place to keep things the way they are. Uh, you know, things such as the important committees, such as the nominating committee. Just look at the makeup of them. They're almost always all white because it's made up of leaders who already came through the bar association. You know, what are the what are the chances of uh, of changing that quickly. It, it's virtually, it's not going to happen. There's the obstacle of cost and money. I mean, money's important uh, to get things done and it's a limited resource. So to what extent is your bar association willing to, you know, earmark dollars to support these, these types of initiatives? Uh, you have, you know, obstacle of volunteer on the opposite end of that, you don't have money, you need volunteers, but uh, you know you can only have so much effort out of your volunteers and some of your best allies may already be experiencing diversity fatigue. Uh, Carl related that uh, earlier today. Mary Lou has talked about it before. There's, it, they, it's tiring to lead the way. It's tiring to tell your story and that comes at personal cost and an additional burden to them other obstacles, inadequate recruitment efforts, biased evaluation and advancement processes, insufficient resources to provide mentoring, and even hurt feelings from old white lawyers who are feel they're being passed over. Um, I, I mean, ultimately, you need to take stock of these things before you begin your leadership role. If you think you're just going to become a leader and be able to fluidly implement widespread and sweeping changes, you're sorely mistaken. Implementing changes and leading that cause takes resilience and often requires a, sick, a thick skin. Uh, just a quick example, you know, when I became president of the bar, or I was about to become president, one of the decisions I got to make was who gets to be on the coveted bench bar executive committee. That's a group of lawyers that gets to meet with the judges and talk about court procedures obviously has become an incredibly important committee this year with all the changes that, uh, that have been brought upon by COVID. Well, when I looked at the makeup of, that, makeup of that committee, it was about 14 old white lawyers, 13 men, one woman, a lot of them past presidents. And essentially, you know, those in a leadership position had routinely reappointed the same people 
And so, you know, I wanted to make a change. I wanted to give, uh, you know, younger people an opportunity. Uh, and so I basically made a decision to ask essentially everyone from that committee. Well, that went over like a ton of bricks. Um, you know, that I was, I was not a very popular person with those people. And, you know, some feelings were hurt, but as I look back, it was the right decision. You know, the, the justification for keeping the way it is, is, you know, oh, well, the, the judges, they respect those people. They've been around, they, you know, they trust in their, in their, uh, their perspective and viewpoint. Well, how can, younger attorneys and people of color rise to that level if you're not going to give them the opportunity to, to give the perspective and, and be a valued member. So, uh, you know, sometimes it, it takes decisions like that. Um, so really the, the focus of my presentation was really to be on the challenges and responsibilities of being a leader. And as I began to list them, you know, the vast majority of them are really both a responsibility and a challenge. And I, I think the number one thing that stands out to me uh, as to what you have to do as a leader is to, is to never cease to seek more education. Um, there's never, there's never going to be a point where you, have, you know too much about diversity or other people's story. And, you know, in this regard, I think you got to start at the very beginning. What is your definition of diversity? And I'm not going to supply one because, you know, there are a number of different definitions and, and that's for you to personally decide. But you're also, you know, you need to understand that there's different types of diversity. And, and if the more you read, the more you're exposed. There's internal diversity, external, organizational, worldview. There's demographic, experimental, cognitive. There's subsets. There's cultural diversity, race, ethnicity sexual orientation, sexual identity, gender identification, transgender, age and generational diversity, disabilities, both cognitive and physical, educational diversity. So, uh, you know, we, we understandably and often focus a great deal on racial diversity, and that certainly makes sense to me. If we can't get over that hurdle, how in the world are we going to be able to, you know, look at all the subgroups. So I, I, I realize it's been a, a considerable focus of today's, uh, today's talks, but you know, realize there's more to diversity than, than, than racial diversity. And you know, far, further on the educational front, you know, uh, always be reading. I, I have an app, it's one of my favorites called Smart News. It has tabs for you know, business news, political news, world news, sports news. And, you know, one of my things I do is if I, you know, read it all the time, but if I come across an article that is meaningful to me, I just email it to myself. And then I, and in the aftermath, I, you know, uh, put them into groups such as, you know, here's a, or a bunch of articles about climate change or, uh, you know, my father suffered Alzheimer's. So I, I'm, I know a great deal about that. I email, you know, I have a whole resource of articles about that. Well, I have one on race and social justice. And, uh, you know, it's important to, to constantly be looking at those things. So obviously, and, and I'm not saying anything anyone doesn't know, but, you know, education isn't simply about reading things. Uh, it's about you know, there's the there's the book smarts and there's the street smarts. So you can you can read all you want, but that doesn't give you knowledge about the real world. So your education continues with engagement and interaction with these these groups of disadvantaged or uh, you know minority groups. And in that regard, you know you need to be engaged. You have to go where the diverse individuals are gathering. You can't insist on inviting them to your turf and, you know, playing, uh, you know, affecting your, your way of doing things. Uh, you know, I've been pleased to attend the Barristers Association, Martin Luther King Day breakfast a couple of times. I recently went to the Asian Pacific American Bar Association banquet. And these are great experiences and that, you know, bolsters education in addition to, you know, just reading things. And I do want to point out when I go to these things, you know who I see? The PBA leadership is always there. Sharon Lopez, David Schwager, Jay Silverblatt, Tom and Kathleen Wilkinson, 
I, you know, I really want to commend them. They are committed to these efforts. Um, you know, I, I, as a leader, you want to foster open and candid conversation. Uh, you know, that, that comes with trust and people won't trust you if, if they don't know you. So it, it, it takes getting out there and knowing other people's stories. Um, uh, important to me, rely on others that are smarter than you. And that's basically everyone I know. Uh, you know, I have great resources like Nancy Walsh, obviously, uh, tremendous uh, resource to our Bar Association. She leads the way for me and I, I'm happy to, to help her, but we have leaders throughout our association that are, you know, just, just doing a very great job. So, you know, collective action, uh, you know, you'll get a whole lot more done than if you're just trying to do everything on your own. Um, you know, I found that focusing your time and effort on, on those that will walk with you is better time spent than trying to convince someone with mental rigidity that, you know, their way of, their limited way of looking at things is wrong. So, you know, put in your time, you know, talk to someone like that and see if you can bring them along. But if they, if they're, they're not willing to do it, hey, there's plenty of others that will. So just move on. Um, you know, transparency is key. And, you know, that, that goes without saying, the more people understand the processes that are going on in terms of elevation to leadership positions and how decisions are made, uh, you know, that, that in, inspires trust in the system. And, you know, back to Mary Lou, stay lit, be lit, live intentionally and transparently. Uh, you know, I think that's, that's, those are key words to live by. So I know, you know, I, I could speak on for a while and I've already done so, but um, I'm going to cut it off there and I appreciate the opportunity to. And... Patrick, thank you. You are a breath of fresh air. And one of the things that I have to mention, and we forget that um, as the president of the Bar Association, Patrick essentially had to put his private practice on hold. Um, and when he told us one day that he has a girlfriend, we were like, no, you don't, because you just don't have time for that. Who are you kidding? Um, anyway, so one of the questions that has come to mind is, so we are expecting um, a white female bar president. What challenges um, do you think she faces right off the bat, Patrick? Well, uh, the budgetary constraints that have been brought on by COVID that, uh, you know, our, a lot of our revenue has suffered with the law reporter being set back. And, you know, as I said, money is an important factor. Uh, you know, you, so, you know, these types of initiatives take, take money and resources. Um, I, I don't think Jackie's going to have a, have much difficulty. She's been involved, and you know she she's aware of all the issues, and and she's as I said, you know, as you start to come into the leadership position, you are you know getting more and more knowledge as as it goes on. So uh, I don't know if I have a great answer for that. I, you know, everyone, you know, as I pointed out, you have your own personal experience, and that shapes how you approach things. So. Uh, I guess, you know, Jackie will, based on her own personal experience, have, have a different approach to things. So I'm gonna take one question before we present um, the um, summary or the practical tips that our team came up with. Um, and this one comes from Sharon Lopez. Um, Patrick, we, if you could uh, address this. So Patrick, what do you think about institutionalizing seats in leadership for local and state bar associations? If having diversity on a board requires diversity on a nominating committee, is creating a permanent seat on the nominating committee or on the board a solution? If not, why not? What other strategies do you, do you suggest we institutionalize in our bylaws? Short answer, yes, I totally think that that is appropriate and it's something that we are now discussing. First of all, the nominating committee does, um, you know, years ago or five years ago, we made a move to make the uh, women in the law as a position on the nominating committee, I believe the diversity committee as well. But 
we're looking now at the board of directors as to whether that is an appropriate, uh, is, is that the way we should proceed? So we are in the infancies of those discussions, but I think that there is a lot to be said for that. Uh, you know, but like there's the, the cross thing is, you know, if you have the one, one position, you know, that, that's people were like saying, oh, well, we only have to, you know, get that one position, you know, they're not trying to expound on, you know, have even more positions. So, uh, but I do think that that's the step in the right direction that uh, we should have permanent positions on these boards to ensure that those perspectives are, are part of our analysis. And I, I do, you know, there, there's some of these are concrete actions that can be taken. We just as a board of directors, uh, chose that any action that comes before the Montgomery County Board of Directors, Montgomery Bar Association, must now include a racial and diversity impact statement, uh, similar to, you know, developers in real estate years ago, you know, developing things without any uh, cognizance of how it was affecting the environment, you know, they began to require that uh, environmental impact statement be included. Well, we're we now we're going to utilize that for decisions that come before the board. So it's an evolution, uh, and I do you know in response to Sharon's question, as I said, I I totally support that. I think that it, it is it is something that we we can do. Okay, um, Nancy, would you put up our practical tips? So in uh, trying to summarize our talks and our feelings um, and our beliefs, uh, we thought it would be helpful uh, to go through or present um, some practical tips for those out there who um, just want to start embracing the mission of diversity. Um, so for some reason, they're all they all start with the, the the C letter, and that's because we all believe that it is crucial to have this crucial critical action at this point. Um, is everyone able to see the screen? Um, so number one is collect and embrace the stories. Don't make assumptions grounded in biases. Recognize you can't begin to fathom the totality of others' life's experiences until you know their stories and make it your mission to hear them. Capitulate to your inability to walk in another's shoes and help anyway. Awareness of the existence of racism should propel you into action even if you have not personally experienced it. Care, care enough to become an ally and accomplice. We talked about how important that is, regardless of the cost, regardless of the fact that someone is going to stick out their middle finger at you and call you a sellout. Who is right with the understanding that standing up for justice for some, I love this, is standing up for justice for all, even when doing so results in difficult personal consequences. Consider the consequences of saying nothing. Accept the reality that the only way to avoid doing or saying the wrong thing is to do and say nothing, which is not an option. Learn your shortcomings and then do better. Connect and expand your network of relationships. Look at us all. How many people do we have here? Look at our network of relationships, build on that, build real relationships with those whose backgrounds and perspectives are different than yours. Relationships develop empathy and empathy inspires us all into action. But you've got to commit, commit your professional and personal energy to the goal of racial justice. Guys, this is not easy. It, it takes a lot of courage and a lot of strength and diversity work cannot be left at the office. Ensure the learning, the conversations and the call to your action follows you home. Make sure it follows you home, that you talk to your kids, your parents, 
your loved ones. Compile and comprehend essential knowledge. Begin with yourself and your own understanding of diversity and inclusion. Here we go, critique, challenge, confront when necessary. Long-standing policies, operations, and methods. Well, this is the way it's been done for the last 100 years, and it's never failed. Why don't just, why do we have to change? We have to be informed and invested. Don't stand by and watch it unfold. Capitalize on collective action. Inspire, engage, and support others. I think that is the end of our session, so we need to move on to the next. Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, Evelyn, and that wonderful, amazing panel uh, from Montgomery Bar Association. So, are, did you want to add something else? You look like you want to add something else. You okay? I think yeah. so. What? Go ahead. Nancy Walsh, did you want to add something else? Oh, no, I'm good. I'm just um, typing. <laughs> trying to do 12 things at once. Sorry about that. Okay, we've solved all the diversity problems. Um, no, just, no, I, no. I always, I always like to, uh, to end my trials and whatever with a good quote. And again, with Martin Luther King, in the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. That's, that's just been an impactful quote for me personally. So I just want to share that out there. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. Um, appreciate it very much. I wanted to share one comment, if I could, as host privilege. Uh, sort of tying back to this morning, I was just personally having um, the situation of really relating to the whole anxiety issue that I, as a white individual, um, can experience that I may not be uh, slowing myself down enough to recognize that it's going on. And then if, if I have that anxiety, uh, then I may not be acting in the way that I would act, right? If I didn't have that anxiety. And if I don't recognize it, then I may project uh, things onto others, particularly lawyers of color, if I'm working with them or staff or clients, because I'm not recognizing my own anxiety. And so I think one of the tips I took from this morning and I'm taking throughout the day is to slow down, doubt your objectivity. Uh, you know, it's, it's really nice to think, I'd like to think that I'm not racist, but you know, definitely I can have racist behaviors. And um, so I need to kind of get over that barrier of thinking that I can just kind of skate by with that. But I, I'll just leave it there. Oh, I'm sorry, I wanted to make one other point. Um, I think too often for uh, uh, in, in white lawyer dominated uh, spaces, there can be a tendency because it's so, so it can be a tendency because it, there can be a white space that if another lawyer comes into it, um, the, the other lawyer, and if the other lawyer is not white, then the other lawyer, as opposed to being known as the individual that they are, just like you would recognize an individual if that person was coming in was white, there can be a tendency to not individualize that person as well. And then it creates for that person uh, as if they're sort of like representing their race, so to speak. When if I, as a, as a white female lawyer think about it, I don't view other white female lawyers and what they say as representative of all white female lawyers. Um, and so, that's just another one of those take backs to me that, and I, you know, I can say that, 
but I'm not sure that I'm always acting in that way. So I just wanted to put that, just put that out there for the group. So we go one, ahead, Nancy. One comment since we do have uncharacteristically for this group, um, a few extra minutes. Um, usually we're running right against the clock. Um, while Joe always likes to end his, his talks and conversations um, with a quote, I always like to, um, to end with a task list, a, a, a call to action. And we spent so much time uh, today, just earlier this morning, and very much through these conversations just now, talking about the, the incredible power of, of relationships. Um, particularly in this work. Um, and that has to be intentionally. We have to, we have to work harder to really truly get to know people who are different than us. So I'm going to ask everybody on this call today or on this um, with, in this summit, pick somebody who has um, who, who has a perspective different than yours that you've heard today, or somebody who just sounds interesting to you. Um, and, and where you found a place to connect that maybe surprised you, get their email and reach out to them. Um, try to build a relationship. Can you imagine the power if we all walked away from today with a new relationship, um, whether it's from you know across Pennsylvania or right here in your own county, but somebody you didn't talk to before, somebody who really adds a different perspective um, to your worldview. So um, that's your homework right now, as if I have a right to give anybody homework, but I was a teacher, so I'm going to do it anyway. Pick somebody from here who, who kind of resonated with you and, and reach out. I'm sure I'm, <laughs> I'm going to throw it at Andrea and Susan and the wonderful people at the PBA that if you need contact information, I'm betting they can help you with that, correct? You bet. So we'll, we'll make that happen. We're all about making things happen. Thank you, Nancy. And thank, thank you, Evelyn, for moderating that session. It was great. I'm gonna transition us now to uh, the next session. And session four is our opportunity to have us break into small groups. Uh, to have some small group interaction. Uh, but we'll start with a large group initial section, uh, which will give you the instructions about kind of what we're going to do. And we hope now in the next, it's an hour and 45 minutes uh, in this session to be able to have time to talk together in our small groups and work on some questions. And then at the high level, will be coming back together as the large group then and sharing them uh, collectively uh, to identify our takeaways, our goals, our resources, next steps. And we have three wonderful moderators to help guide us along in this, in this session. Uh, the first individual, you've heard his name a couple of times, I think, and maybe seen him in the chat. His name is Jimmy Chong. He is the founder and principal of the Chong Law Firm with offices in Pennsylvania and Delaware. He is a co-chair of the Montgomery Bar Association's Diversity Committee and is a member of the PBA, the Delaware State Bar Association and the Delaware Trial Lawyers Association. He was awarded the Horace A. Davenport Award in January, 2020 for his involvement with diversity initiatives within the Montgomery Bar Association. He is a Bucknell University grad in economics and business administration, and he has his estate planning certificate through the LLM graduate tax program, ah, Evelyn, at Temple University. <laughs> then uh, I'm also going to uh, introduce you to Lauren Hughes, Ms. Hughes is a, whoops, that was my timer for the last session. Ms. Hughes is a senior assistant solicitor for the Montgomery County Solicitor's Office, where she represents the county's health and human services departments in all litigation and social services matter. She's a graduate of Widener University of Law, now the Delaware Law School, and Florida Agricultural and Mechanical University. 
which I, I'm pretty sure if I was going to establish a relationship with her, I'd ask about that. Uh, it sounds interesting. Prior to the solicitor's office, she served in the Montgomery County Public Defender's Office, where she conducted numerous bench and jury trials. She's also the current co-chair of the Montgomery Bar Association's Diversity Committee. Uh, and then last, uh, the third moderator here, you've been introduced to already. It will be Nancy Walsh. Uh, she is the owner and founding member of TBD Now, a professional development coaching and project development LLC in Lansdale. And uh, I'm going to turn it over, uh, the program now over to them to do the large group introduction about what will happen next. Thank you, Andrea. And uh, this is Jimmy Chung. For those uh, of you out there who uh, don't know me, I am here in Montgomery County uh, from my home. And before we go into everything, there's, um, I, I just want to thank everyone at the PBA for allowing the Montgomery Bar Association to be involved. Um, there, there's a lot of names out there, Susan, Claire, the Sharons, Jay, Emily. Uh, but I really want to thank Andrea. Uh, over the past six or nine months, you have really shown great leadership and um, I really, really respect uh, everything you've put together. So I just, I just wanna thank you and this has been a wonderful day. Um, <clears throat> now, we've, we've learned a lot or we've heard a lot today uh, starting um, you know, earlier this morning with Dr. Cantor and Dr. Ashro in regards to um, you know, strategies to uh, decrease objectifying negative stereotypes, interracial anxiety and denial. Uh, then we moved over to uh, Sharon and um, having attorneys from different stages of their career uh, speak about diversity and speak about the importance of mentorship. And then we had the great powerful uh, session with the uh, tough talks um, with the members of the Montgomery Bar Association. So this next session is really designed to help us process everything we just took in and to begin to identify priorities, obstacles, opportunities, and the next steps, both collectively and in our own individual roles. Uh, so what we'll do is, uh, Nancy, if you could uh, give a little more explanation into the details of our uh, next session. Uh, thanks, Jimmy. Absolutely. Um, first, if I could just echo uh, Jimmy's statements. The entire planning committee has been um, incredible. Those of us from uh, Montgomery County who had the privilege of working with you over these past, what has it been, 10 years, I think, um, planning this, have been so um, inspired and felt so welcome. And again, not to belabor a theme, but I feel like we made some real friends um, to continue this work. But Andrea, um, you know, I love you all, but Andrea really shines out as, um, as quite the leader and an incredibly wonderful person. So thank you for that. Um, okay, so to take it uh, from Jimmy, uh, when I'm done the instructions here, we're gonna break you all into randomly selected breakout rooms that will all have seven to 10 people, I believe, um, in each room. You're gonna have approximately 30 minutes to discuss three questions as a group. Each of your group uh, of your groups has already been assigned a group leader and, and their only role not, is not to moderate or take over the discussion, but to kind of review any instructions, review the questions and facilitate introductions and make sure everybody's on the same page and everybody stays engaged. After that 30 minutes, we're all gonna come back together and share out to the full group. And in the process, begin to see how our various ideas and perspectives connect. In support of our commitment to ensuring that today's summit is more than just a great one day event, but more a springboard for deeper and continued engagement in this crucial work, we're gonna compile and summarize all the insights that come from this session and throughout the day and share that back with you all in a report in the coming weeks. That summary, however, is only gonna be as rich and informative as you make it. So we ask you through this session, um, each group, um, let me see if it made its way into the chat yet. 
Um, you will, in a moment, have a Google form, a link for a Google form, um, which I do not see yet. Um, if if some of the magic people from the PPA or uh, PBA could could put the link for the um, for the Google form, which contains the questions in the chat, that would be great. Um, what we're going to ask each group to do, um, you're, you're gonna choose a recorder and you're gonna choose a recorder and your recorder is going to be someone who's gonna submit that Google form, which will make its way back to all of us at the PBA so we can create a summary. We also ask though, that as uh, in addition to the collective responses that you individually kind of fill out that form. You can do it electronically, you could print it out, you could just jot down your notes and also share your individual thoughts. Up oh, there goes the Google form. Um, it, share your individual thoughts on each of those questions and either send them back through the Google form, scan them and email them either to me or to Susan Wolf from the PBA. And again, we'll put those email addresses um, in the group chat. That's also a good place to throw in any other ideas or insights that you wanna share, even if they don't fit specifically into the three questions that follow. So I'm gonna pass it off to Lauren, who's gonna give you uh, more detailed instructions for the breakout rooms, and then we'll take it from there. Um, yes, go ahead, Lauren. Good afternoon, everyone. And I echo the sentiments of Nancy and Jimmy. I am just so thankful to be a part of this summit. It Today has been refreshing, for lack of better words, just refreshing and eye-opening that we still have a lot of work to do. But it's exciting that I feel everybody is engaged and committed and ready to do the work. So this afternoon session will really be unpacking the day, unpacking all your feelings. Um, Cause from everything we heard today, I, I, I know everybody has a mix of sentiments. So hopefully we'll be able to express those, encourage you to express those um, during this, this afternoon's discussion with your group members. Since this discussion is all about engagement, I'm asking that everybody please turn on your cameras when you're um, in your breakout rooms, just so that people can become familiar with your faces, can see your beautiful faces, and um, everybody just be willing to actively participate in this discussion. Like Nancy said, if you all, hopefully you all see the link in the chat, if you all would just click on it, just to make sure it works and you have access. Um, if anybody has any issues, just let us know but hopefully it works for everyone. Um, once you get into your breakout rooms, like Nancy said, there will be a recorder and a reporter, um, but I hope everybody will just read over the questions quietly to themselves and just internalize the question and be prepared to discuss amongst your group. And if you don't, even if there's things that you don't want to say with the group, you can also, and, and, but want to share, you can send us emails. The emails um, to send those will be in the chat as well. You can send those responses to us for us to read them and, and report back to the group. Make sure you also put your name and your group, well, your group number on the um, responses so we know what group and the members of the group, not the members of the group, just the group name, we'll see all the members. So. I, I kind of want to rush through that so we can have more time to have these discussions and more times to once we out of the breakout rooms to fully discuss with the entire group. So I think this is going to be so important and so interesting. Okay, I'm going to assume that everybody who is coming back is back. Um, so yes, with a um, thumbs up or a thumb down, everybody have a lively and engaging conversation. Cool. All right, awesome. Um, thank you all for, for sticking that out and still finding the energy to, um, to, to engage in that sort of conversation after a very long and emotionally taxing kind of day. Um, you're awesome. Before I continue into our discussions, I do want to say to all of you, um, what we were saying, just the few of us who were outside of the breakout room that I don't think has been said enough today. Um, and again, I hope I'm not jinxing anything, but 
we have just navigated shortly it'll be eight hours of discussion from uh people all over the country uh via zoom and there hasn't been one i'm afraid to say it a technical technical snafu all day long um people notice the amazing tech people when something goes wrong and nothing has gone wrong so um if i could ask all of you to notice right now all of the um you know those quiet little blocks that aren't putting on the video except for joe walsh you don't have to thank him for technical issues um thank them thank you emily and kyle and susan and everybody at the pba who has made this um seamless it's it's a bit miraculous really if you think about it so thank you all right because we have limited time we'll be unable to give each group the opportunity to share their thoughts on each question we just we would be here forever so for that reason again i want to reiterate it is crucial that every group and if you're willing, every individual submit your responses, both the collective and individual responses, either through the Google form or scanned and emailed to me or Susan. Um, and we'll keep putting those email addresses in the chat so they stay up front um, so that we can kind of summarize them and no, no comment, no voice gets lost. We're going to go through each question individually and ask as many groups as we have time for to share, starting obviously with question one, and we'll get through as many breakout rooms as we can. What we ask you to do is, is refrain from repeating um, you know, comments that were already shared from the breakout room that went before you, just so we can get as much, um, you know, as much content as possible. Um, what I will suggest, because um, this is the first time all day that we're eliciting comments uh, verbally as opposed to through the chat, which, which um, is a different kind of chaos, but in my mind, a lovely chaos, an energetic and um, kind of empowering chaos. So when we say um, Lauren's going to take us in a second and take the first breakout room, whoever the reporter is, for um, whatever room we're on, if you could just put, just write your name in the chat, you know, like Dave would say, I've, I've, I'm the reporter from room one, or call on me, just so we know where to turn our eyes, then unmute yourself and share, um, share the answers to your questions. Does that make sense? Does anybody have any questions? Okay, cool. Um, I do have a question. Oh, hi. Hi. Uh, Pete Scanlon, I'm the reporter for Group One, but I don't have the form that the recorder filled out to report from. Ah, um, that is that is going to become an issue. I should have emphasized before what I'm what I am guessing. I'm going to rely on your powers of uh, memory and the engagement that you had in the. Nope, <laughs> he is shaking his head. Um, <laughs> Just kind of tell us a bit about what you shared, and if anybody from the table, uh, look, Julie, Julie's going to come to your rescue, uh, Peter. Um, she can add to to where you left off. This this is, um, you know, you're, even if you had all the notes, we weren't going to get through all of them. So just tell us what comes to mind, what you recall from each uh, question. Okay, so I'm going to turn it over to Lauren, and she's going to take it from here. Yes, and just like Nancy said, even if you don't get to the typing, just announce, just say your name and what group you're representing, just so, you know, people that are looking at the Brady Bunch board can find your, find your square. So first question again, posed to group one. What in your group's perspective were the key takeaways from today's summit? So these are the aha moments, the enlightening moments as you were unpacking today. And yeah, um, that's Pete Scanlon here. I don't know if I'm popping up there, but uh, I'm the reporter from Group One, and a few that I can remember. Some of the aha moments were one um, program was very unique because unlike a lot of the continuing legal education programs, we got actual real life experiences from people who have been you know, on the receiving end of uh, discriminatory treatment. Um, another one was um, the you know, microaggressions, realizing that racism is not necessarily intentional, um, that it can just um, be small, unintentional acts and statements. 
Uh, another one was recognizing the anxiety and uh, avoidance response um, from people that are not necessarily in the in the minority groups. Um, and those are the main ones that I had. Uh, Julie, if you want to supplement. Um, no, but I, uh, I'll just echo the, the personal experiences that were given today, um, I think um, really are so much more impactful than I'll say um, book learning or the formal education that we all get on racism. To actually hear it verbalized from people that experience it um, just really um, makes you think about how you um, go about your day-to-day -day activities. Thank you, Group One, and I would just say I those personal experience. I agree with you wholeheartedly. I I, I feel like that ties everything together because you can hear you know people talk about racism things, but if it's someone you know and you're staring in that person's face and they're telling you a story and becoming emotional about a story that's important to them, you can't help to empathize or or just feel what they're feeling. So I, I definitely agree with that. Group Two. If the reporter can just announce their name, so. Hi, uh, it's Pam Rayson, Pamela Rayson from Farmers Insurance is reporting. But since Nancy said we can't repeat, you guys stole our answer, but of course it was the, the bonding that occurred and the relatability and just the emotional connection that we were each able to make from hearing those stories shared. So that was kind of our, our major takeaway as well. Thank you, Pamela. Yeah. Group three. I don't know if you're on. Nicole. I'm on, sorry, I was muted by mistake. So our, our group two was struck by the um, by the ongoing pain that everyone said um, from the from the presentations. Um, Someone used the term that it was, you know, from the cradle to the practice of law, even the grave, the experiences that were recounted. Um, we didn't have that diverse of a mini group, um, but we all we all said that, you know, we we were struck by by those presentations, and um, the comment was made that when we were trying to imagine when Jonathan asked us to imagine something that was unjust, that what we could imagine was kind of kind of paled in comparison to the systematic pervasiveness that 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 Patrice and, and Evelyn described. Um, so um, we felt that education to combat microaggressions are, are um, specific. Well, microaggressions are a specific challenge and the way to combat that is through education of the larger community. And so one of the things that led us into the third question was maybe an idea could be, you know, to reach out to the larger community to change the way the community at large thinks, because that affects our clients, um, our jury pools, our, our judiciary and judicial staff is you could give um, lawyers pro bono credits, whether it be within firms or through the Bar Association to not just file cases, you know, such as expungements or, or routine cases for pro bono, but to really kind of do what the Montgomery Bar does, which is like we have a program, it was canceled for COVID, but we would go into schools and read to children in Spanish, you know, kind of like a community outreach that's not necessarily legally based, but a lawyer could get pro bono credits for it um, to kind of educate the public at large. Thank you, thank you, Nicole. And that was kind of helpful because it kind of shifted to group one, group um, three, in case we don't get back to you with your answers for group three and the next step. So I appreciate that. Group four, Colin. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, yeah, <clears throat> our, our primary focus was what's already been said. So we won't repeat that in terms of the empathy. Uh, aspect of it in that exercise. I'll just note that hearing about it from someone you know from Montgomery County and, and then empathizing with that by trying to personalize that on the experience that you had was particularly impactful. But, but the, <clears throat> the one additional thing that our group talked about was the initiative of the Montgomery Bar Association that President Curtis brought up, which is having the impact statement, the, the diversity impact statement 
um, discuss for all initiatives coming before the, the board because it forces the committees or the sections or whomever is going to put something forward to the board for consideration to, to consider its impact on diversity. Uh, and just forcing that discussion we thought was a great thing. Okay, and, and I think the, the last group we can hear from in, with this particular question is group five. Do you have anything unique to share that we have not already heard? Uh, good, good afternoon. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay, um, group five, I think. Um, thanks, Michael, for clarifying that we were room five. I'll bootstrap on what's been said before, but we, we did have some diversity in our group. Um, and, and I think that one of the high points was that not only the power of the presenters this morning, but the fact that minorities have to do twice the work, the energy that it takes to not only deal with the task before you, arguing your motion or at your hearing, but also then as a secondary issue, dealing with the systemic racism that's around you so that there's just, it, it becomes tiring, it's an uphill battle, and there's sort of double the work because of this systemic racism that's permeating our system. So that was the high point, I think, to, to the first question from group five. Thank you, Andrew. I'm gonna pass it over to Jimmy to go on to question two. Okay, great, thank you, Lauren. Uh, so, Question two, uh, what are the specific challenges you now face or anticipate facing in the creation of meaningful and lasting change in regard to diversity, equity, and inclusion in the legal community? So we'll, uh, we'll start off on group six. Who is the um, reporter in group six? That's me, Jackie. Um, we had a couple of different views. Um, we had someone from Philadelphia talking about how sometimes when you live in a diverse place like Philadelphia, the theme is that it's not a problem that we have here. Um, so why are we even touching it or why are we only dealing with it? Um, also, there was the theme that when you live in a small town like Erie, it's like, well, wh why do we have a need for diversity? I mean, we're, it's, it's an ingrained racism and uh, you know it, it, it's the small town big town and both of them have have issues dealing with with the challenges of getting to diversity and inclusion and there's always the constant pushback um, people don't like change people like the status quo uh, it's hard to get uh, the, the needle to move even the slightest bit over 10 years um, so I, I those were the, the general views that we had from the group okay that's interesting that um... You know, there's going to be different challenges for different groups depending on where they, they're they're located or what type of community uh, the community makeup. So that's that's very interesting. And yeah, change is always tough for for everyone, but we definitely yep. need to start making changes. So um, we're gonna go move over to group seven. Group seven, uh, who's the reporter over there? Hi, it's Karen. And is this Kathy Man? Oh, Karen. I oh. was going to say, did oh, we pick Kathy a reporter? Melody. Go ahead. <laughs> well, we were talking privately. Kathy was was our great recorder of everything, but um, I'm just somewhat going off of, of the memory uh, since I can't access the link. But I think without duplicating what other people were, were saying, um, I think one of the challenges and, and maybe a disheartening thing was for those of us who've been practicing for decades, still hearing that even the, the younger um, attorneys amongst us are operating on the, you know, keep your head down and do your work and, and pay your dues before you're, you're allowed to speak up. Um, and that was something that, you know, I was taught 25 years ago. So I think some of the challenges facing us here is recognizing at least this isn't a substantive legal experience. This is something that is an, an experience that, that all of us are trying to engage in. So I suppose from us, bring along the, the, the younger voice, bring along the person who doesn't have as, as much experience and, and give them the seat at the table 
Um, they have so much to, to offer in this respect and, and don't need to be molded by the pay your dues mentality. So, um, and then when we also talked about just to, to reinforce what the prior reporter had said, for people who, who are in smaller communities that don't have as, as much of a racially diverse, um, reach out to somebody else who does and, and bring them to your presentation, your organization, you know, try to, to expand across your own borders. Yeah, they're definitely great points. And, um, you know, the challenges of bringing in younger voices are, is always a challenge and it's a, it's a good thing. And I think we have a couple of young voices out in the, the audience today, um, Lauren being one of them. Um, so uh, group eight, Who's the reporter there? Oh, wait, Lisa Sherman was group eight because her microphone died. Um, Carlton Johnson, she wanted so us Carlton to Carlton Johnson, okay. So Carlton, are you able to give a report or Julie Arabeck? I can give it if Carlton can. I took some notes. Um, so some of the challenges are, you know, when there's an economic downturn, you know, it's a disproportionate effect on um, minorities. So that becomes a problem that I don't know how we solve that as lawyers, but that's an issue. And um, we need to, I think this has already been kind of touched on, but we need to um, expand our sphere of diversity so that we're not just um, staying among, you know, we're not, you know, we're not, um, we're just staying among, you know, our different groups as opposed to reaching out, you know, to others because we all do seem to operate sometimes within a bubble. Yeah, that, that is a good point. Um, you know, if we're able to expand in other circles and meet new people, new diverse minds and, and way of thinking, um, that is that is a challenge that, um, you know, we, we've all frankly been dealing with. So hopefully we can, all of us can take uh, time out. I think as, as President Curtis stated earlier to go in and do that. Um, so thank you. Thank you for your thoughts. And I don't want to run over. I think we're still good with time. Um, I see, well, I just, I see Carlton Johnson pop up. Did you want to add something, Mr. Johnson? Yes. <clears throat> One of the things that I think needs to happen is to change the shareholder compensation system and to tie it uh, in part to diversity and inclusion efforts. Okay, that's a interesting thought and definitely for the the bigger firms that's something that uh we can you know they should take in consideration um so uh let's move on to group nine who is the reporter over in group nine hi mary Kay kelm i'm here uh reporting for group nine and um I'm not going to repeat the suggestions we've already heard, but in question number two, my group was focusing on challenges. Um, specifically, one of our group members had described some great diversity initiatives that her governmental employer had put in place, and a recent challenge were, were executive orders that basically undermined or created a lot of confusion with regard to those diversity initiatives. Um, then turning more to the private sector or to attorneys in private practice, um, a specific challenge that we discussed quite a bit was the burnout. And uh, for a few of the members of our group, that was one of their aha moments, I guess, as well, or something that particularly resonated with them. Uh, and so in focusing on the challenges, that's where our, our group uh, plays the most importance. We also discussed some of the previous issues too. Okay, thank you. And, and that burnout is, is an issue. I, and that was stated earlier today, um, where after the murder of, of George Floyd, we saw that there was an increase in a lot of public um, outcry. And they said that, that we're kind of going back to a baseline. So we need to, to figure a way how to address that, that burnout. And that's been mentioned earlier as other speakers as well. 
That's a good point. Thank you. Um, let's go to group 10 and the reporter over there. Hi, it's Rachel Hadrick. I'm the reporter for group 10. So as far as challenges um, that we discuss, um, one of the um, interesting challenges that we kind of talked through was for um, someone who wants to do uh, anti-racism work and is uh, genuine um, and wants to do it right, uh, how do they go about doing it right? Because, you know, as attorneys, we, we, we thrive on preparedness and having like all of our ducks in a row when we show up. Um, to court or you know, closing. And the thing about this work is that sometimes you just have to do it and you have to be prepared to make mistakes and continue and not um, kind of fall back just because you make a mistake and maybe someone reaches out, you know, uh, maybe has a problem with the way you're doing things. But in order to really do the work, there's not always going to be a right way to do it. And you kind of have to just put yourself out there. Um, another thing we talked about is sometimes it's difficult for um, people of color who, um, you know, where racism has always been at the forefront of their lives and so prevalent in their lives. And it's like, how can you not see it is understanding the notion that, you know, as some people have shared today with their upbringing, that they come from somewhere where maybe there were so few people few people of color that racism wasn't a prevalent issue because there were no people of color to experience racism, right? So it was like, um, some when that happens, sometimes it doesn't even come into your into your purview that racism is exists and is happening. So um, coming to the realization that that's some people's experience and that they're coming from a frame of reference where racism isn't a thing altogether and, and they have part of the process is coming to awareness that racism actually exists. Whereas for many people of color, it's such a, you know, it's a part of our daily lives. And so the idea that it doesn't exist is like inconceivable to us. So like bridging that gap of those two experiences. So those two very divergent experiences. Yes, that is a good point. Um, you know, uh, go, we're gonna have to move along now. I'm gonna pass this over to Nancy Walsh in, in, uh, for time's sake. So Nancy, um, you wanna? Thanks, Jimmy. Um, first of all, I, I just thought uh, all of the comments were so wonderful, but Rachel, the, uh, the, the notion that, you're, that you shared for your table that so a bunch of attorneys who are used to being prepared and having their ducks in a row and um, we're, we're all being called to, to do something that's messy and hard and that we're going to make a lot of mistakes on. Um, I don't know. I just had kind of a personal aha moment with that. Like, duh, that's one of the reasons this is so hard. Um, so thank you for sharing that. And um, I kind of want to keep that, that kind of insight going as we share, um, share the responses to question three, which require us to think out of the box, to not edit, to be willing to say, oh, this is probably a crazy idea and it's going to be a little messy, but let's explore it because um, the neat and tidy ideas aren't really going to get us very far. Um, so with that in mind, please, uh, please share um, both the thoughts that you you know, kind of recorded for your group or anything else that comes to mind and springing off of what other people shared, regardless of how kind of out there the idea might seem. So I think um, we are moving on to group 11. Hey Nancy, this is uh, Joanne LaRose representing um, group 11. So we spent a, a good bit of time um, talking about the, the pipeline. And it's not just your traditional pipeline that starts from your, your first year associate or even your law school, but we talked about even going back as early as kindergarten. So kind of building you know, that sense of a pipeline just at a very early age all throughout. And then not just stopping it when the person starts as a, you know, a first year at a law firm, but then couple in a program 
where your rainmakers, your people that are bringing in all the money, you know, they have their their clients in that work, and a portion of that work is then aligned to a minority, you know, first year, you know, second year um, associate where they can actually get, you know, meaningful work. And it's not just that, hey, I've got some work for you and I'm gonna stick you in this document review where you don't learn anything, but to actually give them something meaningful that they can learn and grow from and, you know, be a better attorney and, you know, set up that type of program. Um, and then we did at the very end and then we got cut off. So I am not going to do um, Jay any justice in this, but he had uh, talked about very briefly a diversity and cultural show and tell. and you know, I hope Lance that you took really good notes on that because I had missed out my audio went out, but I did want to put a, a nod to Jay there because he had mentioned um, that idea. That's great. Would uh, Jay, do you want to share just a bit about what that was so that we don't miss out on that um, idea? Sure, sure. That was my that was my idea from left field and uh, geared towards kind of breaking down barriers. Uh, and, and trying to eliminate uh, the anxiety by going back to grade school and doing the old fashioned show and tell. Uh, all of us have uh, cultural heritages that are different from one another and <clears throat> we can all learn something about each other's backgrounds and experiences by just sharing them in a very non-threatening sort of way. That's okay. awesome. Um, interesting because we uh, we have here in Montgomery County in the North Penn area a um, uh, international spring festival, which is very much dedicated to show and tell and um, really celebrating each other's diversities or backgrounds or stories or traditions and um, kind of a cool notion to bring that into this work and and you know, also I, I love uh, your thought, Joanne, about starting uh, from kindergarten. I know a lot of the people when we were doing recruitment with the law firms or with the law schools, <clears throat> the number of um, law school uh, administrators who said to, to all of us who work in bar associations, if you're starting your recruitment efforts and your diversity efforts in law school, you're way behind the eight ball. Um, and so, again, the more we can pool these collaborative ideas and make this a cradle to grave um, sort of effort, the, the better off we're going to be. Um, thank you, uh, table or room 11. Uh, room 12. Hi, Chloe Mullen Wilson here. Um, so we had like a similar conversation as to um, group 11, so I won't go into that so deeply, but um, I, another idea that we had was to make diversity a CLE requirement uh, for attorneys and make that, you know, part of our yearly uh, credits that we have to get. Awesome. Um, I just want to kind of refer everyone to the, to the great idea in the chat room, kind of building off the idea that, was sh that Jay shared, um, you know, sharing meals. There, there is, I don't know about the rest of you, but there is no closer way to connect with me than to feed me. Um, and if I can learn about your culture and your um, perspective while you're feeding me, food that matters to you, I'm in. Um, so I love that idea. Uh, thank you, Chloe and everyone. Um, 13. Hi, John Goff, we're uh, 13. Um, you know, we spoke of many of the things that have already been touched here, but one of the things that we discussed was learning how to use the differences in our diverse attorneys, rather than making our diverse attorneys conform to what we expect them to be. Um, in doing that, uh, there needs to be open discussions. There needs to be a way to find out uh, how to allow these discussions to take place without risking harm to the relationships within the firm. And that's one of the biggest challenges I think that, that we all face. Um, and, and trying to get to that next point. Um, one of our young attorneys mentioned, she always wishes she could give her personal experiences to the firm. You know, th this is how I was treated in a certain circumstance. This is how it made me feel. Um, again, it goes back to creating an environment that, that would enable that. Um, one of the recommendations that I thought was outstanding was that the, uh, you know, the diversity chairs are often appointed by the firms. Um, and the recommendation was to allow the diverse attorneys to have input in who is the leadership in that regard, because they can fully understand 
um, you know, what's, what's going on and what's needed. Wonderful. Um, I'm going to kind of break break our uh, cycle here and see if any of the groups, um, so the notion of, of sharing our stories and our experiences safely within our firms um, seems keeps coming up. Did any of the individual breakout rooms have specific ideas for how we might, you know, facilitate that for ways we can kind of conquer that challenge? And forgive me, you're just gonna have to speak if you if you have an idea, because there's I can't see everybody on here. Anyone? Okay. Well if um if that's if that's the case, um, you know, kind of put that in our heads as a challenge and an idea, a challenge and an opportunity, I like to think of it as that we um, can put some energy towards. Um, Nancy, so let, it's, it's Jen Coatesworth from Philadelphia. Hi. One, I, hi, one idea that I shared that's sort of a concrete idea is something that we've done here in Philly and I sort of mentioned it in the chat um, earlier today was that we have a diversity inclusion action plan that our Philly Bar Association passed back in around 2012. Um, and one of the requirements there is that each of the 52 or so members of our board of governors is required to complete a diversity inclusion action plan checklist, which includes many of the specific tasks that we discussed in the program earlier today, um, things like bringing diverse attorneys to events with you, going to um, events for the affinity bars, educating yourself and reading various articles, um, promoting diverse attorneys to leadership positions, things of that nature. And uh, there are specific consequences for our board members who fail to comply with the checklist requirements. Wow. That is awesome. Um, could, could I ask on behalf of, well, myself and, and I would imagine many others, could you share that checklist I, with us? I did actually. I sent it uh, via email to uh, Sue Wolf and the leaders of the Minority Bar Committee. So uh, it should be coming out at some point to the participants at some, some point soon. Wonderful. Um, Hi, just, this is oh, Jackie. Oh, hi, hi Jack. Jackie. I just wanted to interject and sorry, Jen, I wasn't quick with the mute button because I did want to bring that up. That was a great idea. Um, but I, I want to bring up an idea that we've had here in Allegheny County for a long time, and that's the Rooney Rule. And if anybody is involved in sports, they know what the Rooney Rule is. And Art Rooney and, and put this rule in for the Steelers that any time a position opens up, there should be a person, a minority, a person of color to be considered as well as anybody else. And I think that should apply for everything that we do. We try to put that together as part of the PBI when choosing speakers or when creating a panel that there should be always a diverse person included in the panel and for anything that we do. And this can really translate to anything for nominations or boards, et cetera. Uh, it's very simple. Just include somebody in a person of color in whatever selection process you have. Um, wonderful. And I love how you said it's very simple. Sometimes we make these things awfully complicated and um, in reality, a lot of them aren't. So I love that. Um, I love that perspective. Um, Mary Lou asked me to repeat my question from earlier. Um, so I, I think um, my, the point I was trying to make is the notion of, of getting our pers the personal experiences of diverse attorneys uh, kind of front and center and more well-known within the firms or the organizations that they're working for seems to be an important uh, tool, an important step that would help us um, you know, go further in these efforts. My yeah, question was, who, if any of the groups had discussed ideas for how to make that happen. Um, yeah, our group our group did it in group 13, and what we had is an incredibly simple idea. Every Friday afternoon, you get somebody else to tell about their, their life story. You don't have to make the minority people feel uncomfortable. You have it for everybody because everybody in the firm has a life story. 
And it's just that that way you're including the minority person when it gets to them, they'll tell a different kind of life story. And it's every Friday afternoon for a half an hour. It's no big deal. That way you get to know where everybody's from and what their background is. Gosh, I love that. What a great idea. And flipping back to earlier, if we could do it over food. Yeah, there you go. Got a winner there, right? right. <laughs> Nancy, That's thanks, awesome. thanks for repeating that question. And I agree with what um, Michael Sand has to say because it's about having a flow of critical conversations with one another. Um, and the, the more, you know, it's like the more we talk to each other, the more we realize the things that we have in common. Right. And then we start to make those connections. And as we start to weave that network of connections, then that gets us to a place of hopefully comfort where we feel OK to be vulnerable, to share some things that have happened in both directions, because it's all about understanding one another and being able to to be open to those conversations. It's when we shut them down in either direction that no, you know, nobody wants to take the time to get to know what, what your story is. And so I agree with um, Michael completely. And I think that's a great idea to carve out a period of time to do that. Awesome, Nancy, thank you, Nancy, Mary. I have one quick comment as well. Um, when we talk about expanding our sphere of diversity, I think we're all mostly attorneys on this call, but also crossing those educational and professional lines, right? It's easy to just say, okay, I know a minority lawyer, but sometimes we have to step outside of that lawyer um, box. There might be, a, I don't know, an accountant. There may be a plumber. There might be someone without a, um, a college degree, just a high school diploma or without a high school diploma that you can learn so much from. So I think too, to step outside of our own professional sphere of diversity and look to everyone. Cause again, we can all learn from each other. It's not just, you can learn from other lawyers that are diverse. We can learn just from people that have diverse backgrounds and backgrounds that differ from ours. Yeah. Such a great- Can I piggyback uh, on that? Can, can I piggyback on that comment about course, expanding our sphere of diversity? So in our group, uh, Patrick gave a great example of personal accountability that he plans to execute from a bar association perspective. And that's to serve as a liaison uh, for other bar associations, for example, something like the Barristers or the Asian uh, Bar Association. And I thought that was just a great idea of kind of crossing uh, those perceived barriers and, and forming greater connections. I just wanted to share that. That's awesome. These are just um, amazing ideas. I wish we could keep going forever. Um, I have two minutes and one table left. I'm not sure how that worked out quite so nicely, but um, table 14, where are you? Hi, Janelle McAdams, table 14. Um, which question are we on? I got a little lost along the way. <laughs> yeah, thank you for pointing that out. Uh, really, that was the intent of this discussion. They're all gonna kind of dovetail into each other because you can't talk about the ideas without the challenges and hopefully the aha moments are informing all of them. That well, said, we are on the question talking about ideas, out of the box ideas for collaboration or ideas that you've um, you know, experienced in your own realm. Sure, sure. I mean, I, I've worked in a bunch of different situations. I'm, I'm not an attorney just to share that people who are not in my group. Um, I'm director of operations in a paralegal, um, but I have worked in different law firm settings and courts and things in in-house. <laughs> um, so I think I've seen quite a few uh, things to try. I think a lot of things have been mentioned, but um, yeah, I mean, absolutely. I, I hate the idea of over committing anyone, but committees inside committees and groups inside of groups sometimes help, um, you know, getting that cross section, you know, you're working with people in the business all the time or in the tax all the time, mix them up, get people together, so that they're interacting with different people within the firm, within the corporation, wherever you might be. Um, it's just, really simple way to do it. So everyone's getting to know each other on a more personal level, not just necessarily working with the same people all the time over and over again. Um, but also before I got involved in law 20 something years ago, um, I worked in retail <laughs> for a very long time. And I learned something from retail, which is to not just pull people from where you expect to pull them from. So yes, you know, high school teaching them to go and be encouraging people going to pre-law and college and college, getting them to actually go to law school is great and everything. But um, sometimes you see people with 
some sort of ability or something and maybe they just haven't put that connection together for themselves. Um, and you see, you know, hey, you ever thought about going to law school or hey, you know, what do you do? Have you ever thought about, you know, being a paralegal? Um, and you might unintentionally steer someone in the right direction. Um, I had an instance where there was this woman who was a receptionist. Uh, she'd come from Puerto Rico. English was not her first language. And she felt really uncomfortable speaking in front of people. Um, she just had a great personality and worked real hard. And it, now she's running her own business um, <laughs> because all it took was me saying, hey, I think you want to, it seems like you want to do more. You want to try something. And it just went from there. I'm, I did not do all that myself, by the way. I gave her <laughs> one one option to do something else um, and that she did it all herself. But um, I think just being alert and open to possibilities and talking to different people, like uh, Lauren said, outside of, you know, just even as a lawyer, you know, anywhere you might be, anyone that you're talking to, there's always an opportunity there. Thank you, Janelle. I think those are perfect comments for us to end on. I'm going to pass it over to Lauren to wrap us up. Um, thank you, everyone. Yes, I'll be sir. very quick because I don't want to stand between everybody. And I, I believe we have a short 15 minute break. But I just want to thank everyone for participating today. This was a very important brainstorming discussion. Um, I hope this is not the end of these discussions. I hope this is the start of these discussions, uh, uh, many more to come. Um, if you have not submitted your responses through the group, through the Google form, please do so. If you have any additional comments, Nancy, I guess if you can put your email um, in the chat for anyone that outside of that Google form have any, addi any additions, please send them to Nancy at this time, preferably before October 9th, because I believe we're gonna be reporting it back um, to all the participants. But again, I thank you. And it was a pleasure just participating with you all today. And uh, this is just very exciting that we've actually took the time to have these discussions. And I truly believe that people are genuinely engaged and ready to do the work. So thanks again.